Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to welcome you to our short video session. Um, we had a SCAD patient symposium in Nashville, Tennessee on August 26th. Um, it was a wonderful event. Um, there were over 80 registrants from 14 different states that came and um, it was wonderful to see patients meeting other patients and really that was probably the best part of the event. There was a session that we had promised um, that we would broadcast live on Facebook but we ran into some technical difficulties and the internet cut out about 10 minutes after we started so I wanted to keep my promise and um, here I am representing the last talk that I gave um, at the Vanderbilt SCAD Symposium on August 26th and this session is comprised of questions and answers um, the answers to the best of my ability that is um, questions that were submitted by patients um, through Facebook and some common questions that I also hear in clinic um, and so I hope you enjoy this presentation so the presentation is entitled life after SCAD and um, these were again presented at the SCAD patient symposium which was held um, at the Vanderbilt Marriott um, on August 26th. This program was made possible by generous um, contributions um, from uh, philanthropists um, and so I and the Vanderbilt Heart and Vascular Institute would like to express our sincere appreciation to the family of Anne Fensterwald Eisenstein, the Fensterwald Foundation, and the Eisenwald Foundation for generously supporting this patient symposium. So as I stated, there were patients who came to our symposium from over 14 different states. Um, and uh, it was about half patients and half pa patient families because we know that SCAD affects not just patients but their family members as well. So before I get started on the questions and the answers, I wanted to make a few disclaimers. One, thank you very much for posting your questions online. It's very helpful for other patients as well as medical professionals to hear what is going through your mind and what you are going through at home so that we can best help you. Two, I tried to answer the questions that I hear the most from my patients. Three, I did my best, but I only have 30 minutes. I will do my best, but I can only tell you what we know and what we know from science, and that may not be satisfying to you. And finally, these are my opinions. I will put some data in where there is data, um, but a lot of SCAD um, practice is, uh, is, is that, just practice, and we need more research. Um, this does not represent medical advice that replaces that of your physicians. And so if you have a medical question, the best person to ask would be your own personal cardiologist. So the first question we are asked is, I am four months post-SCAD, two stents. I went off all medications as I am a mom of three and they were sucking the life out of me. What are the ramifications of doing so? Well, in terms of the medical management of SCAD, there aren't any medications that were developed specifically for the treatment of SCAD. What we use are medications that we use for patients who've had heart attacks because the vast majority of patients who've had SCAD present as heart attack. There are very important classes of medications that you may hear about. Some of them are called antiplatelet agents. These include medications such as aspirin, or Plavix, Ticagrelor, Prazogrel. Um, there are also classes of medications called beta blockers, so Coreg or Carvedilol, um, Toprol or Metoprolol are a couple examples. ACE inhibitors or ARBs are blood pressure medications, but also medications we use in patients who have evidence of a weakened heart muscle or heart failure. Statin medications are medications we use to treat cholesterol and also are very commonly used after heart attack. And then antianginal medications are medications we use specifically for the treatment of chest pain. So in terms of medications, why do we use them? Well, the newest data has come from Canada from Dr. Saw. 
and it turns out that recurrence may be less for patients with good blood pressure control. And she looked at her group of SCAD patients in Canada, a little over 300 of these patients, and she followed them out um, for a median of over a little over three years. And if you look to see, are there any risk factors that can help predict who has a recurrence of SCAD and who doesn't have a recurrence of SCAD, it turns out that those who have a history of hypertension or high blood pressure have higher rates of recurrence. So these two lines, this blue line are patients who don't have any history of high blood pressure, and this red line are patients who have history of blood pressure, and the y-axis here is recurrence of SCAD, and so a recurrence um, of SCAD freedom from recurrence. So those who have um, high evidence of hypertension actually have more SCAD compared to those that don't have hypertension, um, and the difference is about twofold. So more data from this same study shows that patients who were taking beta blockers um, when they are followed out over time seem to have less recurrence in this blue line compared to those patients who were not taking beta blockers. Um, and in this study, over a median of about three years, there was about a 60% reduction in the rates of recurrence of SCAD. It's very important to note that this study was not a randomized control trial. So a randomized control trial would be that in which we would take patients with SCAD, half of them would be assigned to beta blockers, half of them would be assigned um, to not beta blockers, and they would be followed out over time. This is an observational study, and so we don't know why some people were on beta blockers or why some people were not on beta blockers. All we can say was that those people who were on beta blockers tended to have less recurrence. So our next question is, how to safely get off all or most of these medications when they give you, um, they give you when you leave the hospital? Is there a more natural alternative to these medications such as healthy lifestyle, healthy eating, and regular exercise? So a plea from Dr. Kim, please do not stop your medications without first speaking with your cardiologist. Um, especially if you have a stent, you must not stop your antiplatelet agents because you will be at risk for developing a heart attack. So that being said, um, there is evidence, like I just showed you from Dr. Saw's group, that beta blockers may reduce the risk of uh, recurrence. We also use aspirin therapy um, in all patients who've had heart attack. There isn't great evidence for that, but most of us agree that patients who've had heart attack deserve to be on some aspirin for at least a, a bit of time. Um, and the other medications are still under study. But because your situation is unique to you, you may have some weakened heart muscle, you may, you may have had um, multiple stents placed, um, you really should not stop medications without first talking to your doctor as stopping them abruptly can result in very dangerous situations. So our next question is a very hot question, a hot topic. What's known about the hormone connection? Well, as you can see from this figure here, that the menstrual cycle is very complex. We've got um, action happening at the level of the ovaries, the pituitary gland, um, as well as the uterus. And the heart probably fits in there somewhere. Um, and as you can see that when ovulation and menstruation occur, there are fluctuations in levels of various hormones, such as estrogen and progesterone. There's fluctuations in body temperature. All of these things lead to the menstrual cycle. So there are some observations that give credence to the potential relationship between hormones and SCAD. Well, for one, we know that 90% of patients with SCAD are women. We also know that SCAD is the most common cause of pregnancy-associated heart attack, myocardial infarction. So if you look at the potential predisposing factors um, that have been listed in the literature, we see that hormonal therapy, being postpartum or um, around the time of pregnancy, having had multiple births, um, have been listed by patients uh, when they are asked, um, do you have any hormone history? Um, however, there are some other observations. Men suffer SCAD, so 10% of SCAD occurs in men, and obviously there is no hormone connection there. Um, and also, postmenopausal women suffer SCAD as well. 
And so if we look at that data again, those who are on hormonal therapy in the postpartum state or have um, had many births, four or more, are actually in the minority of patients who have had SCAD. And so I, I think my personal opinion um, is that there probably is a hormone connection, but it's probably not the single risk factor. Um, so we hear you. Um, here is a, a, a patient on Facebook who says, I too would like to better understand the hormonal connection, particularly ongoing palpitations and angina that so many of us have before and or during menstrual periods. Another person says, I second this question. My heart attack from SCAD was just before my period. All significant bouts of angina and palpitations are just before my period. And every time I've had to go back in for a catheter procedure due to intense angina, as a result of significant blockage from scar tissue, has been just before my period. And then finally, I would second the question about the hormonal connection. My cycles were regular as clockwork before my SCAD, but since, they are essentially non-existent. I joke it was my rite of passage to menopause, but really, it it does seem beyond coincidental. So there are validations to your observations. So if we look back in the literature, we see that um, the heart and the female hormones have been studied, and it turns out that blood flow to the heart, anginal symptoms, heart rates and heart rate variability all do differ uh, depending on the place um, of that menstrual cycle, where you are in that menstrual cycle. So there likely is some contribution of um, female hormones and perhaps timing of SCAD. So the bottom line is, yes, there is probably a hormonal connection. Um, prior work and small physiologic studies have shown changes to the cardiovascular system with the menstrual cycle, and this definitely needs to be an active area of research. Our next question. I'm 16 months post-SCAD and still suffer from pains in my chest. My doctor is not concerned. Is this a common side effect to a SCAD and um, is there any treatment? So this is data from the Cleveland Clinic SCAD registry, which uh, we presented at the 2017 FMD Research Network and SCAD Symposium in Cleveland, Ohio um, this year. And yes, the answer is um, cardiac symptoms um, are common and they are persistent. So follow-up number one means that patients who've had a SCAD came to see us in clinic and then um, about a few months later would come back for their first follow-up. Um, about a quarter of them didn't report any cardiac symptoms, um, but about half did report chest pain um, and another quarter reported palpitations and about one-fifth reported shortness of breath. And these patients were several months out from their acute heart attack. Um, and so cardiac symptoms, including chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, are fairly common after SCAD. The understanding um, of the reason why chest pain happens after SCAD is incomplete. Um, there may be some uh, residual pain from um, dissection or residual blockages in the small arteries or perhaps even abnormal nerve firings. Um, these are things that need to be studied and we don't understand why. Um, there are some anti-anginal medications that could be tried. Um, beta blockers um, can be helpful for patients um, to treat uh, not just blood pressure or to prevent recurrence, but they can actually help with chest pain symptoms as well. Calcium channel blockers, such as amlodipine, um, have been tried as well. Nitrate medications, such as Imdor or isosorbide mononitrate, and then medications such as ranolazine or Renexa. These are all medicines that your doctor has available to try in your particular situation. And then certainly, um, chest pain is common. So the question is, how do I know when my chest pain is dangerous? And how do I know when I should go to the ER? And I would say that any chest pain that reminds you of your heart attack um, is severe, is ongoing, isn't relieved with nitroglycerin, um, or just gives you that sense of this is not right. Um, these things warrant emergent or urgent evaluation, and you really should get uh, go to the emergency department to make sure that things are okay. No one knows your body better than you, and so if your internal um, alarm is going off, um, it's always better to be safe than to be sorry. 
So our next question is, for a SCAD survivor, is there any way to test for FMD without extensive radiation? So screening is important. We know that over 60% of patients have FMD or fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, and I don't go a lot into fibromuscular dysplasia here during this talk because it was extensively covered during our session during the symposium. But FMD is a, um, it's a non-atherosclerotic, non-inflammatory disorder of the arteries, which similar to SCAD primarily affects women. It can cause um, blockages, dissections, and aneurysms. And it turns out that if you look for FMD um, in patients with SCAD, you're going to find it anywhere between 40 to 80 percent of the time and I say greater than 60 kind of to be in the middle. Um, we also know from multiple studies that up to 10 percent of patients with SCAD have a brain aneurysm and diagnosis is very important because there are preventative therapies um, particularly for aneurysm um, treatment may be life-saving. So the question goes back to radiation. So how do I diagnose extracoronary abnormalities? Meaning, how do I look for um, dissection, aneurysm, fibromuscular dysplasia outside of the heart? Well, there are several ways that um, can, can do this. These are um, listed here in this table of pros and cons. Um, my personal preference is to use the computed tomography and geography CTA because this really gives me a road map of all of the blood vessels at once. Um, it's very good for the detection of aneurysm, um, dissection, as well as fibromuscular dysplasia. The disadvantage of CTA is that um, there is radiation associated with this and that there is contrast associated with this. Um, and radiologists have to be familiar with the subtle findings of FMD. There is also magnetic resonance angiography, which does not involve radiation, um, but this is not as widely available um, as CTA, and the spatial resolution is less than CTA, particularly for FMD. And so it can, um, the expertise required to have an adequate study using M um, MRA uh, may not be as available uh, where you are. Duplex ultrasound um, is also does not require radiation, um, but duplex ultrasound is highly technician, um, technologist uh, dependent. It's also interpreter dependent. The findings of FMD are different than the findings of atherosclerosis on ultrasound, and readers have to be familiar with those differences. Um, and unlike CTA or MRA, duplex ultrasound is really limited to the area that you're looking. So your doctor may order a carotid ultrasound, um, and you may find the FMD in the carotid arteries, but certainly it doesn't tell you if you have a brain aneurysm. Um, you may look for FMD in the renal arteries, but it may miss the aneurysm that is in the um, a mesenteric artery. So it's not a roadmap like the other uh, imaging modalities. Ultrasound frequently is used uh, for surveillance of findings. For, so for example, if I find FMD in the renal artery by CAT scan, the initial um, study, I may go ahead and follow that lesion using ultrasound to save exposure to radiation. And then finally, um, while you're in the cath lab with your SCAD, um, some interventional cardiologists may go ahead and perform what's called an aortogram, where they will inject dye into the aorta, and um, using that, we can see the branch arteries um, in the abdomen. So um, the pros are that this is a test that can be performed while you're there in the cath lab, and um, um, sometimes the sensitivity of FMD may be higher because we have direct visualization, but again, it's not a, um, it, it may actually be lower depending on how this exam is done. Um, this is additional radiation, additional dye, and sometimes if you're critically ill, this may not be performed. So there are lots of ways to look for extracoronary abnormalities, um, and the hope will be that we will come to consensus um, as uh, more and more SCAD patients are studied. Our next question is, what is the chance of recurrence? Well, there have been some studies to look at recurrence, and this is a very interesting study that was published by um, the Mayo Group. And what you're seeing here is target vessel revascularization. And so basically what this figure is showing um, are patients who were treated for their SCAD with medications alone compared to patients who were treated um, with stenting um, 
And what we see is that in those who in those patients who required stenting, the artery that had the SCAD um, had higher chance of needing more intervention, um, more trips to the cath lab, compared to those patients who were treated with medications. So in terms of target vessel revascularization, how many times did you have to go back to the cath lab to treat the same artery? If you have a stent, there is a higher chance you'll need to go back to the cath lab. And, and this is a complex issue um, related to the complexity of treating a dissection versus treating a blockage from cholesterol plaque. Um, it has to do with how SCAD um, lesions tend to be very long, how multiple stents usually are required to treat these long lesions, how intramural hematoma um, can improve with time and the stent is sized to the size of the intramural hematoma um, and is no longer sized correctly when healing has happened. So all of these factors may play a role in that. What is interesting is if we look at recurrent SCAD, um, meaning another heart attack, these two groups, whether you had a stent or not, um, had the same rates of recurrence of SCAD. And why is that? Well, it's probably because um, when you have a recurrence of SCAD, it usually happens in a different artery um, than the original SCAD happened. And what we know is that recurrence is not uncommon. And again, going back to Dr. Saw's data, which is the most recent data um, of over 300 patients who were followed for um, about three years, we see that recurrent myocardial infarction or heart attack happened in 16.8% of patients, and recurrent SCAD happened in about 10% of patients over that time. So um, our next question. Cardiac rehab wants to know my restrictions, only avoiding getting blood pressure up or also moving my body in certain ways. You said you didn't think yoga would be good because I could hyperextend my neck. I wonder if these things, um, if these are things I should avoid for a certain amount of time until my dissections heal, or are they things I can't do for the rest of my life? I'm curious to know how fragile I need to treat my body without becoming a couch potato. So exercise post-SCAD. So, this is what I think of when you're asking me how much you can exercise and my brain starts to go crazy and I start to have palpitations in the clinic. And this is actually what I hope you're doing as exercise after you've had your SCAD. And so um, these are two extremes of exercise um, and probably doesn't fit the category of what you're probably doing. Um, the majority of you being um, women in your 40s and 50s. So this question was actually addressed at the second international FMD research network um, and SCAD symposium in Cleveland earlier this year. And there was a working group for exercise and activity after SCAD. And our charge was to strategize methodology for the development of an expert opinion consensus statement on post-SCAD for exercise and activity, one for medical professionals and also for patients. Um, and these are the take home points from that meeting. Um, one is that we all felt that exercise was important in the short term and the long term to maintain cardiovascular health as well as mental well being. Um, we understand that there are theoretical risks with physical activity post SCAD, um, but these theoretical risks, and I guess the fear would be that you would have a recurrence of a SCAD um, with vigorous activity. Um, and this fear can lead doctors to actually cause over restriction of activity. And to be honest, the risk of recurrence probably varies. Um, did you have a SCAD while you were exercising? Have you had multiple SCAD events? Do you have an underlying arterial disorder such as fibromuscular dysplasia? Do you have evidence of dissection elsewhere such as your carotid arteries? All of these things will play a role in determining what is the safe um, level of exercise for you, um, but it's important that everyone maintain a minimal amount of cardiovascular exercise just to maintain long-term health. So we also agree that everyone should be referred to cardiac rehab, and to be honest, this um, is to reassure the doctor as much as it is to reassure you. 
Uh, one, that you can exercise safely. Um, two, to reassure the doctors that when you exercise, you are not developing chest pain, that your EKG is okay, that your blood pressure doesn't go too high. The focus on exercise really is to um, maintain health um, and not to become the world's extreme athlete. Um, and as I said before, your activity limitations will depend on your extracoronary findings. Um, Dr. Melissa Wood at Mass General um, said it best. She says that you can run the 5K, but just don't win it. Our next question is, is SCAD a genetic disorder? So, in my opinion, probably, but, we know that most patients with SCAD cannot identify another family member with SCAD. We know that testing for the known inherited genetic disorders has been shown to be low yield. And um, we know that genetic testing can be considered in certain situations. So if you are a person who has had SCAD and then your doctor screens you and finds multiple dissections elsewhere, for instance, in the carotid, in the iliac artery, but also finds a brain aneurysm or an aneurysm in the aorta, these are indications that perhaps a genetic um, test for a known gene abnormality may be useful. If you have a very compelling family history of uh, aneurysms or dissections, early heart attacks, early strokes, these things may be helpful. Um, and then certainly if you have other connective tissue exam findings such as hypermobility uh, of your joints, um, easy bruising, skin laxity, um, and other findings that typically go with connective tissue diseases such as Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos, genetic testing may be considered um, in your situation as well. We did look to see um, what is the prevalence of um, these other arterial diseases in patients with SCAD. Um, and these are data, again, from the Cleveland Clinic SCAD registry, and we presented these data at the American College of Cardiology in 2017. And what we did is we asked 64 of our SCAD patients if they had a first or second degree relative um, who had early heart attack, aneurysm, stroke, early hypertension, a connective tissue disease, dissection, or FMD. And what we found is that there is, um, number one, um, the prevalence of aneurysm was quite high, 26.6% in a first or second degree family member, um, as well as early heart attack in about a third of um, patients' family members. And these high prevalences really did not differ um, when you looked at uh, the statistical significance in patients who had FMD somewhere else and patients who did not have evidence of FMD. So uh, SCAD may be an alternative manifestation of another um, genetic disease that uh, predisposes people to aneurysm and dissection, and certainly this is an area of research that um, requires significant attention. So in summary, um, we have a lot of work to do, but together we'll get it done. Um, and I want to let you know that you're not alone. Um, SCAD is considered a rare disease, but as you know, because you found these Facebook communities, um, there are other people out there who are going through the same thing as you. And so I would encourage you to continue to be engaged um, with other patients and to also be engaged in the SCAD research. Um, there are organizations um, such as SCAD Alliance, which um, aims to bring patients together. And I'd like to thank SCAD Alliance for partnering with us um, to help make this uh, SCAD symposium happen um, this year at Vanderbilt. Finally, um, I'd like to end by telling you about the iSCAD registry. And the iSCAD registry is a multi-center registry um, that we will hopefully be launching off the ground um, very shortly. Um, our hope is to have um, hospitals and medical centers around the country um, see SCAD patients and enter the data into uh, one data repository so that we can quickly answer the questions that I've discussed here. Um, 
Because gout is a rare disease, no one researcher can see enough patients in a short enough period of time to be able to adequately answer these questions. And so the mission of the International SCAD Registry is to develop and maintain an independent quality data repository to advance the pace and breadth of SCAD research around the world toward the common goals of improving patient diagnosis and outcomes and accelerating scientific discovery really in the hopes of preventing SCAD and its recurrence. iSCAD is funded by SCAD Alliance, um, and we're very excited to be a part of this. So um, I thank you very much for joining me for this very short uh, video conversation. Um, I hope that uh, there is some clarity that was brought by answering some of these questions. But again, these are questions that don't have good answers yet. And I hope that in years to come, I can give better answers. It was really nice spending time with you and have a good day.